Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And um, welcome to the second lecture uh, presented this fall as part of the lecture series, First Person Narratives for an Accessible Built Environment. Um, just admitting everyone to the group here. There we go. So, hi, uh, my name is Kate Clark, and I'm the project coordinator with Peach Research Unit. Uh, for those of you who maybe haven't attended one of our lectures before um, or just aren't familiar with us, PEACH stands for Planning for Equity, Accessibility, and Community Health. And we operate out of the Dalhousie University School of Planning, where Makiko Terashima is a faculty member as well as the lead researcher here at PEACH Research Unit. So we perform research and participate in community projects where they are aimed at informing policy and practices so that planners can build more inclusive, equitable and healthy communities in Nova Scotia and beyond. Uh, we also very strongly believe in learning from individuals who have personal lived experiences of the barriers and opportunities that exist in our built environment. And this lecture series is part of uh, our effort to share those individuals' uh, expertise um, to a wider audience. So thank you for attending. We're gonna hear from Andrew Jansen today about uh, his experience of the accessible housing market in Halifax, uh, as well as his experience of um, barriers and opportunities in other public spaces. And just before we hear from Andrew, I would like to acknowledge, oh, sorry, my screen share is a little slow. There we go. I would like to acknowledge that we are recording this lecture from Halifax, Nova Scotia and Dalhousie University, uh, which is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And we are all treaty people. the screen. You've noticed we're also using um, Zoom's meeting platform today instead of Zoom's webinar platform. So what that means is I'm going to kindly ask everyone to keep their microphones muted and videos off for just the duration of Andrew's presentation so that we can respect him as the speaker um, and prevent any interruptions. There will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation uh, where we'll take questions from you and uh, we may invite you to then turn on your, your screen and your microphone so you can ask your questions to Andrew directly. Uh, but until then, if you can just keep your, your uh, videos turned off and microphones muted, that would be, that'd be great. Um, we also have, sorry, my slide is being a little bit fussy. But we also are gonna use the chat today, which should appear on the right side of your screen. Uh, and if it doesn't, then you can turn it on using the chat button at the bottom in the menu. Uh, and when you participate in the chat, if you can just please make sure that your message is being sent so it can be viewed by everyone, uh, it should say there to everyone so that everyone can uh, view your comments and participate in the conversation in the chat. And finally, this presentation is being recorded so that we can share it online at a later date for uh, individuals who are unable to join us um, today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the controls to Andrew, our speaker, so he can introduce himself and begin his presentation. Hi, thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, I am excited about talking about these issues today. Um, it's a very kind of personal uh, side of things. So some of it I'm going to talk about a bit from my work context. I work for an organization called the Tetra Society of North America, and we build custom assistive devices for people. And it's relevant in this context because we do a lot to adapt the, the gaps and, and the ways that our current structures just don't meet people's needs. Um, so that's it's relevant here. I'm involved in a couple of you know, committees and work on the provincial level with accessibility and the built environment. And you know, I, I do think that those things are important for you know, advocating for change and helping to make some systems uh, do things a little bit differently. 
But today I'm going to focus more on my, my personal experience of some of the challenges of accessible housing, uh, finding it, um, finding true accessibility, navigating changes with my own um, disability and how that's uh, come together with <laughs> the lack of accessible housing and how, yeah, how that, you know, it continues on, like that's an ongoing thing that, uh, that myself, uh, along with most people with disabilities navigate. So I'm going to talk about that and then also throw in things around the types of policies and systems and structures that are behind what's going on there. Um, so to start, one thing that I want to do was just toss this question out there. And I'm thinking that, you know, right now, if you want to just think to yourself about what comes to mind first when you think about accessible housing? What's that immediate word or two words that's, you know, is it, um, you know, is it that there's a gap? Is it, um, is it uh, that it just doesn't exist? Or is it that it's nearby or that you need it? Whatever that thing is, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And just take a minute to think about that. And at the end, um, we'll kind of come back to that and yeah, just see how that, yeah, how that fits. So for myself, that word where I kind of started thinking about this, the word that came to mind for me was interconnected actually, because accessible housing and the rest of my life <laughs> is all connected. There's, there's, there's not a lot that I can do unless I have accessible housing. So one, of the, so one of the ways that that came into play really early on for me was that I, my mobility declined. I have a, I have a condition where uh, most of my joints are hypermobile. My back likes to dislocate on its own. Um, that's, a, that's a daily thing. So I got to a certain point where I just, I couldn't walk anymore um, for any extended length of time. And uh, I had collapsed and needed to find uh, a way to get around. And moving forward, it was looking at a wheelchair. But in order to get a wheelchair, I first had to have accessible housing. And I lived in a place with stairs and that had been workable, you know, with a cane and somewhat with a walker, but really just not possible with a wheelchair. If you can't get in and out, um, maybe I could get around inside, but if you can't get in and out, there's not really a whole lot that, you know, you can't, you can't really, you're isolated, you're just stuck there. Um, and in order to even get a wheelchair, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that without seeing an OT to assess, you know, my needs and all that. And working with the OTs, um, they wouldn't let me even take a wheelchair home until I lived in an accessible place. So that was from the get-go, you know, going through the rehab here, which is you know, the only place where you can access an OT through the public system without paying out of pocket for it. Um, and so that's where most people have to go through. And if that's the process, um, you really just can't access a wheelchair until you have accessible housing, um, especially if you have something that has a higher, um, you know, higher cost or it's harder to find or anything like that. I couldn't find a wheelchair that was used that met my needs. I couldn't just go out and, you know, find one. I didn't have the funds to do that, that kind of thing. So any of those barriers mean that people are more so stuck in this cycle of accessible housing. The lack of it means that you're literally just trapped in either something that um, kind of works or just doesn't work at all because there just aren't options. So I was struggling about what to do. I reached out to the Canadian Paraplegic Association to just ask the questions of even how do I find accessible housing? What do I ask about? How do I know? Because you, I would phone and I'd ask a place, are you accessible? And they're like, I don't know. What does that mean? <laughs> and there was no understanding about even the basic level of what someone might need. Um, people would say, oh, we're accessible. And you'd say, do you have any steps? And they'd say, there's only one. Well, I can't get in then. That's not accessible to me. Accessibility, yes, it means different things to different people that we have very different access needs sometimes. Um, and, and that's real. 
but even just having that base level of you know that there are there are certain things that um, in an accessible place that you're going to need and you're going to want um, like having more space for mobility aids or having um, yeah having things like that are very important for me so I had a few organizations trying to help me but even with all their help we couldn't find places one of the only things that was suggested to me and I'm just going to share oh can you make me the host here so I can share my screen uh, I'm going to share some photos today about a few things. And the first one is the, I uh, will just flip back. Sorry, hold on one second. I want to show you the right photo. Okay. I use my, my joystick on my wheelchair as my mouse, so I'm just uh, flipping between things right now. Okay, can you see my my photo here? Can get some nods for the people who are, yeah, okay, great, video is sharing. Um, so this is me, uh, you can tell from my photo here that I am outside, um, I am near my house, I am, this is a sunny day. When I was looking for apartments, this is the one place that people always suggested was that I needed to look at Northwood um, to the to either um, the they have apartments that you can uh, stay at Northwood where you're not actually in like the long term care side of things, but they're more you know apartment style places. But that was one of the only places that people would suggest to me for a place for a young I was less than thirty year old uh, person young person with a disability was moving into Northwood. Um, so that to me wasn't the option that I wanted to go with, um, but the place that I did find, um, this photo is actually after I found it because this is just down the street. Um, so I can actually see the Northwood building from my window. <laughs> so full circle, it's still there. Um, so trying to find accessible housing, I didn't go with Northwood. I was trying to find a place and anywhere that was accessible, again, was not even in the areas where my community was, where my, my medical needs would be met, where there were even grocery stores, anything like that. So it was very challenging. What I ended up with is a place that really isn't accessible. Uh, I can't, I, I could barely get into the building to start with. Um, I, there's a flight of stairs at the front of the building. I use a back door that I can kind of get open. I, um, it, it, the driveway was impassable in the winter. I was basically just trapped inside most of the year. And I can only get to my bathroom. Just to see what's the next. Uh, I can only get to my bathroom using a forearm walker and not my wheelchair. So I did actually get a wheelchair once I moved into my apartment. This is my, uh, my bedroom door. It barely fits. This is a standard sized doorway. Anyone with a wheelchair that is slightly bigger than mine, which mine is one of the smallest ones for adults, would not be able to live in an apartment that was like mine because they just their mobility aids wouldn't fit through the doorways. Um, so that's, that's, that's the reality of accessible housing, um, of being able to find it, and then navigate with what you have where it's really not what you need. Um, so some of, the, some of the policies and the systems here at play, some of it's more about mobility aids and you know, making sure that people have what they need to get out and even access spaces to begin with that way and how they seem to be tied to accessing accessible housing. Like this is a really, this is a point that I don't think a lot of people realize is that a lot of people um, continue to be trapped in inaccessible housing without mobility aids. Um, just living in one room, even in a place with stairs where they can never get out aside from maybe with a lot of help getting to doctor's appointments and things like that. But that's just where, we're, where we are. So we kind of have these assumptions that people with disabilities will be taken care of and that our needs will be met that way. But in reality, there's a lot of this where it just feels like 
we are not valued in what we can contribute or how we participate in society. Like all that time someone's trapped, you know, you could be volunteering, working, engaging with family, community, anything at all, but it's not deemed to be valuable during that time enough to, to get people um, even that basic kind of access. Yeah, so there are, uh, there are some things that exist for being able to get some accessibility in housing. Oh, yeah, there's my new wheelchair that I got. Um, it took a very long time, but I was very excited and I do have it now and I can get around my apartment. So just wanted to share the happy face. Um, so there's a few things that can be done. You can put in bars and various ways to adapt things. Um, this is my bathroom in my apartment. I've added some things to make it a little bit easier, but there are, uh, if you can access, and this is the only way I can access my bathroom is this walker here. Um, if you can access some kind of funding, you might be able to have a bathroom that works for you. Um, it's still very difficult to do. This is actually at the DMV, not in a house. Uh, but I was really happy that I could actually use a, a bathroom and turn around in it, which is not doesn't really happen very often. So, you know, there are some funding, but it's really, it's a little bit easier to access if you have your own building, you have a home like that. Uh, it's, it's not possible for most people who are renting um, to be able to, to get access to something like this. My family home or my mother lives in Alberta. We have some people in our family who are very handy and can you know, do uh, some of this stuff without um, needing to, to you know, pay extra and hire people. So we actually put in this lift here uh, to, for me to be able to go and visit. But most people can't even access other people's like, places, other people's homes. So even if you do find somewhere that's accessible, um, it's, it's really, that's the only place that you can go. So people are, you're constantly only uh, able to spend time with people in your own space and never in anybody else's, which is kind of unfortunate. Like that's not really a way to participate in community as a whole. That's, that's still inaccessibility and isolation. But that's kind of the idea is like, we're kind of expected to be happy with having this, you, know, you have your accessible housing, that's enough. It's, it's not enough, we need community accessibility. Um, back to the bathroom one for a second here, just that one thing that uh, I, I did want to say at, at this point is that Tetra, my organization, this is a lot of what we do is adding things to homes or to spaces for specific people to be able to access things. There's a lot of bathroom setups that we've done where uh, it's a custom uh, type of, you know, there's not enough space to put what someone might be able to buy to transfer from a chair to the bathtub. So we'll make, make something custom to be able to do that. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice to be able to offer that. It's a, we offer it as a pay what you can type of service and it's all you know, done in partnership. So you know, I've needed things and it's people work with me one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, or in, in a small group to figure out what's gonna work for me. And I get to be a part of determining what that's gonna be like. So yeah, as an organization, if anyone wants to, to check that out, our website is www.tetrasociety.org. And maybe there's someone who can throw that in the chat um, for people to, to check out. So my housing is partially accessible, but I wanted to say a little bit about how that has not been an easy process I've been fighting my landlord since the beginning for basic changes. Uh, when I moved in, he had agreed to make certain changes and they didn't happen either. So even when they had said and promised certain things, that's not what happened. Uh, even something like, I can't get down the stairs to the front door and the buzzer wasn't connected. I couldn't let my personal support workers in to get me out of bed. And that took weeks and weeks and weeks to resolve. Um, under threat of human rights involvement and that kind of thing. Uh, but that, you know, that one was resolved at a certain point, but a lot of it still isn't. Um, one, one major one is getting in and out of the building on its own, not even getting into my apartment, 
but this is what my driveway at the back of my building looked like when I moved in. So um, this is a it, a, it was cement at some point. It is cracked and broken in every single part of this driveway. There are like really large parts that are mud that I would sink into by several inches. There's piles of snow that haven't been cleared in weeks. Um, there's so many places that I could just, I couldn't get over these bumps and I would get stuck and I couldn't get out myself. I would need somebody else to come out and rescue me essentially because I would get stuck right outside my own house. And the excessive bus also couldn't come into the driveway because of the state. So I would get stuck down here at the bottom with the excessive bus waiting at the top and they're not allowed to come down. And I'm just waving frantically <laughs> trying to, you know, trying to address that situation. But that's how it was for months and actually years. Um, and it continued even after I took this to the Human Rights Commission. I, I took it to them and they accepted my complaint and it fit within what, what they do. Uh, but the issue was it, it just never actually progressed. So I actually, some of it is, from my perspective, I think I had a different idea of what the Human Rights Commission would do, um, those expectations of, um, in, in going through the process, it, it's really more of a kind of mediation where everyone's perspective is viewed as equal, uh, as opposed to what I would, I, I kind of assumed as being the people who have been discriminated against uh, would be kind of the people who's like, you know, that is what's being investigated. Uh, whereas I was told at various points that um, I should go in and and uh, try talking to my landlord because it seemed more like a communication issue that I should try resolving that way, despite the fact of having a pattern of, you know, trying to, trying to do that for, for years and it not actually resolving the issue. So there's some really strange things that happen in that process. Uh, right now it's on hold. I have been told that um, it's on hold indefinitely. Uh, I think there are various factors. Don't know that they have the staffing capacity um, it, it seems like they uh, don't have necessarily as much understanding of disability issues as would be helpful. Uh, so that kind of thing. So right now, I would say that the Human Rights Commission and the way that that navigates uh, um, accessibility issues, there are some things to address there. Um, personally, is what I, I, I think. Um, yeah, it, there's a lot to it. Accessibility is, is more than that, that step in the process, but the way that landlords are able to not, not, not follow through on any kind of accessibility and accommodations in housing, and then not have it be enforced in any kind of way, and where the system is not able to address that, you know, how, however that happens, they just, they're not able to. Um, and that it just continues on that way. We really, we really need to address that somehow because that is another factor where, you know, it, now that I've been through that process, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not gonna tell people to necessarily do that because it hasn't helped my process. I haven't gotten any further. The things that have helped more so are creating awareness in uh, community and creating media uh, coverage and getting those perspectives out there that way when something like this photo and you know I'll, I'll kind of flip through a few more here of just showing a few more of these spots that I've been stranded um, where this is not acceptable and this should never be acceptable there are people in my building who also use walkers and canes and who've slipped on this and injured themselves too and the landlord actually, when he would drive his truck in, he would avoid all these spots. He wouldn't take his own truck over them. But for some reason, it's acceptable for this to happen if you're renting a place. Um, and, and how is that okay? How is that okay? So eventually this did, this uh, driveway did get, uh, get, did get fixed. There's a, uh, there's a photo here of me smiling at the end of the driveway and 
they didn't pave the whole thing and they did it in such a way that it doesn't drain properly. It gets too icy in the winter. They don't clear it. There's not enough space for the excessive bus to get in. There's a lot of issues that when they did it, they didn't consult anyone. Um, so that's, that's another point that I think is important is that accessibility is about not just that, you know, the standards or, you know, either the people who enforce it or landlords, but it's about every single person in that process. The people who did this driveway, if the people who worked at companies like that, I don't know the specific one and it doesn't matter, but any of the places who are doing the work, doing the design, all of those steps, it's important and critical that everyone in that process has at least some understanding and emphasis on how people are accessing this. It, you know, you don't even like the, framing it around, you know, disability is one way to do it. It's also about safety of everyone. Like I was saying, everybody in my building has injured themselves on this. It's about everyone's safety and particularly those of people with disabilities. But yeah, so anyway, I, I can get in and out more so than I used to. And some of it was helped by some conversations with the Human Rights Commission. I do think that, you know, there's some uh, progress that has been in, made um, with their help. So that it, some of it is helpful. But a lot of this was from community push. A lot of this was from people who did that extra, went the extra mile to advocate for something in a different way. Um, you know, to call uh, political representatives and people in community, we did that. You know, we involved people like that to be able to get this to the point where it was somewhat resolved. So I could not have done this without, a, you know, the support that I've had from friends and community. It just like, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's incredibly draining to, to fight these kind of battles every day. Um, because it's not just those little pieces of, you know, it, it is, it is those little pieces of, you know, you know, making sure that you have that, that spot to park and that, you know, that access, that thing at work. But when there's also the underlying fights with systems that just, there's no shift that's happening along the way, it's that extra grinding that gets, gets to you. Um, so that's why it's, so important for people who are involved in these systems to really understand that impact and know that anything that you can do to shift that is powerful. Um, so yeah, okay, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, one thing that I haven't touched on a lot yet that I wanted to say and, and, and provide a little bit of focus on is about accessibility and affordability. Um, accessible housing and affordable housing, for some reason, are not really mentioned together as much as I think that they need to be. For example, even this morning, I saw an announcement for the new rapid housing initiative in Halifax, and there's eight point something uh, million dollars that's allocated for these new um, or converting places to affordable housing. And in the list, it is mentioned of, you know, it, they're taking a human rights approach to this and prioritizing certain communities, and it includes people with disabilities. But accessible housing is for everybody. It's not just for people with disabilities, it's for communities. Anyone benefits, like people who um, have kids and are using strollers, right? Any, anyone with, who's navigated space with families like that, it knows that accessibility is, is for everyone. And so when we look at buildings and we look at housing and we look at affordable housing, especially, to me, that's an area where we always need to bring up affordability and accessibility at the same time. So, you know, my apartment is not currently accessible and eventually I'm going to have to move. Um, I, I can't access the bathroom very well. And that is a problem. It's been a problem at times and I've had to extend hospital stays because of that. And, you know, I've had, yeah, people suggest um, and, and, you know, things that are pushed in the direction of long-term care. And, I'm always looking for a place that is more accessible than this. And I think that's the case for everyone that I know with a disability is that 
we're always looking for accessible housing because what anyone has that I know isn't really accessible. Um, but the fact is that we're not finding it. Um, there are a few things that are accessible that are very, very expensive, but there's absolutely nothing in the area of affordability. And I will go on to Kijiji and I'll see, you know, if, if, you, if you do this, you'll usually find at least a couple of ads where people are looking for affordable, accessible housing in the range of anywhere from 600 to $900 a month um, and maybe a little bit more, but this is the range that a lot of people are able to afford when you have a disability. Um, and yeah, you can't really find an apartment for that anywhere right now, but that's also what people can afford. And I think we need to remember that, um, that you know, just because there, there is something out there doesn't mean that people who need accessible housing are going to get it. Um, so, yeah, the, that search for accessible housing, what I'm often told is that, that developers are what we need to create affordable, accessible housing, that the market will, will, will make this happen somehow. And what I see is that the, the result of that are apartments that are $1,500 one bedroom accessible apartment might be the lowest that I might see. And I might see that maybe once a year, um, but that would be, that would be maybe, that would be a typical browsing of accessible apartments. They'd also mostly be out of the city. They'd be in, communities that are away from where most people um, currently are. You usually have to move away from your own community. And also that, you know, because of the cost, it's often the only way that people can afford them is with a rent supplement. And that also is, again, hard to access. There's a process for that that is, you know, you kind of have to know about it. And it also takes a long time. Um, but other than that, what are the other options? Let's see. Well, public housing. I have looked at public housing and started that process. Um, I had submitted an application for it and the response was, do you really need accessible housing? Because if you do, it's going to be a very long time. Um, so if you can deal with something that's not accessible, you should do that. So we're, I don't know if that was actually word for word, I wouldn't quote that, but that's the, that's the idea is I was basically, they, they basically told me that there aren't accessible house, housing in public housing that is going to be available for a long time. Um, and basically that if I'm going to find an accessible place, it's going to be with a rent supplement go back to what I was just saying about what there currently is with, you know, how the development market is and all that, you know, finding a place for that rent supplement, you know, it also puts all of that on the individual, that individual person with a disability to do all of that work of going out, making the calls, figuring out what something is accessible, what does, you know, all of those details when there aren't accessible places, that is a really unrealistic expectation to put on individuals with disabilities. You know, yes, there are some housing supports, but they very rarely are actually able to find places. You know, I, I actually, you know, a, a few people who do that type of work and they're constantly saying like, we just can't find them. We just can't find the places. They just don't exist. Um, so there are, um, yeah, there are people who are moving into long-term care prematurely uh, just because there is no accessible housing. There just aren't the options. And like, I mean, one, one point about that too, is that this idea of what, how accessible something needs to be before someone needs to move into long-term care, like the type of accessibility that we have, we could do, we could make things a lot more accessible. We could provide spaces that had a higher level accessibility. That would mean that people could live in community much, much longer. 
But for some reason, we don't do that. And I think one of the reasons why we don't do that is that we don't actually ask people with disabilities what they want and what they need in the accessible housing. It's just, we determine what accessible housing is. And then if you don't fit that mold, then you have to go with whatever the other option is. So involving people, you know, this kind of series is, is, is great in that sense because it's, we need that engagement. We need to have that voice because that's the only way we're gonna build accessibility in a way that works for people. Shelters aren't accessible. Most of them aren't. Um, if you are living with homelessness, there aren't a lot of options for where to go. Going to friends' places generally, again, not going to be accessible. Um, I, when the last time I, I did not have secure housing for a period of time, you know, I was able to live at a, a family friend's place for a short period of time and jumped around with a few friends, but all of them had stairs. And so I would not be able to access those the next time I would go through that process if, if that happens. Another, another point being, um, yeah, they like, you can't really live with a partner um, if you're uh, looking for accessible housing and you're dependent on some kind of um, government support. There's these ways where if you're living with a partner, like my, 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 the support that I have would then take into account the other person's income and both of our supports would be cut in that sense. So it, there's a lot of barriers in the system that are these little things that aren't about accessible housing policies. You know, they're not about that, but they prevent people from getting accessible housing and getting what we need. So I see that I am, I'm kind of running through things and I wanted to touch a bit on um, an aspect about safety. I touched on that at one point, but I've had a few instances that I wanted to share of situations that are just so ridiculous and unsafe that, um, yeah, so I'm going to show you some, some photos of this too. Like when my landlord did all of this work, I got trapped in my, like they did the work on the driveway. I got trapped in my building for about a week. Uh, they did it with absolutely no notice. I got a note slid under the door that said that this was happening the next day. And then it actually happened sooner than the note, or it said it was happening in a few days. It actually happened the next day instead. So I came out to the door to go to an appointment. And this is what I saw. Um, there is no driveway. It's just gravel. There is a backhoe shovel in the background and like the edge of a cement block that I'm on here by the door. That's basically it. That's as far as I could go. Um, so this photo from the other direction shows the cement pad that's right outside my door. And when I tried to address this issue, we went to a number of different places, but we went to, um, to the, the fire marshals was one of them because it seemed like, you know, in a fire, this would be unsafe. Like I couldn't get out of the building to be safe. Um, so, you know, we went there and what they said was because of this cement pad, that's right outside my door, that's far enough. So because this cement pad exists and I can get out of the building far enough that all of my wheels of my wheelchair get out, um, there was nothing that they could do. Um, now they, you know, they still tried to do what they could. Another limitation is that when there's a violation of the fire code like these, they have to give them, I think it's 30 days to comply. So in the, that time span, somebody can be trapped for an entire month. And there's not a whole lot that they can do about that with the existing policies and the way that that system works. So whew, yeah, that was, that was challenging, challenging to navigate. Being in the situation where literally there's nothing, the, the system just says there's nothing that they can do. At this time, I was taking the Rick Hansen accessibility training. That made it even funnier to me that that was happening. And then I, I went to the training and told them about this experience that was happening to me. So yeah, you know, here's, here's another photo of the, the driveway and just the fact that there's absolutely no driveway there. Um, there's, a, there's a backhoe and a giant pile of dirt that like, I mean, no cars could be able to get up there, but even just walking through this would be difficult. Like there's, 
there's loose dirt, gravel, piles of things, holes. Like this is what anyone would have trouble navigating. And without any notice, anyone who can't do the stairs at the front of the building, trapped. Um, another incident that happened that again, the fire code um, was a thing that we tried to, to use was somebody chained a bicycle to the ramp that I used to get to the back door so that I could not get by. Um, I was trapped outside at this point. So this was the opposite problem. I couldn't get back in. I was sick and needed my meds and it was actually getting to be a, a critical issue. Um, so we, we involved the fire department again and um, they did they did come and do this, but um, in you know in, in learning a little bit more about the the you know the fire code and what they're allowed to do, um, like I I think that this was more of a uh, like an individual case. Like I I think according to like the the rules that there's like a in there's if it's an active fire. Um, they will come and do these types of things, but otherwise it's more of a case by case. So this was a case by case. You can't generally count on this being the case that someone will just come with the jaws of life and cut the bicycle off so you can get back in the building. That's not, you, you can't rely on that. But it was cool. I did get to see the jaws of life for the first time without being in like a serious emergency, preferably. Um, so yeah, there's a fire person here that's got these massive, massive jaws of life just to cut a bike off because someone couldn't uh, put it underneath the stairs instead. And in this case, that person actually was was told uh, not to put it there. They were told to put it under the stairs um, and uh, and still didn't do it. So in these cases, there's also that part about individual, uh, the way that these play out in not individual, but human behavior. So there are things that we build into buildings. We build ramps, we build stairs, we build, you know, we put barriers up, we build driveways and tear them down. Um, there's also the way that people choose to do things um, and how, how aware they are of the different space. Like during an actual fire, uh, recently uh, somebody in my building jammed the fire door open with something. Uh, and it, it, that item stuck out into the doorway and I couldn't get by. So it's, a, it's another incident where it, it's like people are behaving in a way that is not including or considering the other people in the spaces. And I don't really know exactly what to do with that or how to, you know, how to, how to solve that. But, you know, we need to find ways of including people with disabilities in our communities so that people you know see the value can can know that importance and yeah like you know do a little bit extra and that consideration like it, it, it's such an easy thing just to move a bike by a couple of feet um, it, it shouldn't be asking a lot to do that um, so yeah you know leave leave that for a minute and come back to a few things but the, the idea of safety and the things that we do to ensure that people with disabilities are safe and going to be alive in emergency situations, I think are a critical issue around accessible housing, like the lack of evacuation maps that are accessible and in lo accessible locations. And that's accessible in lots of ways, right? Like having things that are also um, having like raised texts and other ways for people to access, whether it's about, you know, sight and hearing and different types of ways that aren't about mobility. Mobility is, you know, my experience and perspective, but I don't, I, in my, you know, looking at these things, like I'm not seeing or observing any other ways that they're being adapted around accessibility either. So, you know, that it, safety and what we're building in these systems has to change. We need to be, you know, aware of, you know, when people with disabilities are in a building having a plan so that, you know, uh, like my partner lives on the 10th floor of a building and, you know, there's been times where there's actually emergencies and the fire department has not come to get them. <laughs> and that's 
terrifying. I mean, it's terrifying for me too to like be like, I care about my friends and I'm like, I live on a ground floor and it terrifies me when I've been in the library and there's incidents where I'm stuck up high. And that type of thing is like a fear that um, and a reality of people with disabilities living in inaccessible housing. Like that's, that's, just, that's just a reality. Like people are trapped and we can't assume or rely on so far the ways that either cities or landlords or managers so far have been planning how we navigate emergencies. We know that in COVID, people with disabilities have, have been you know, experiencing the brunt of a lot of those effects and people are dying because of it. And it, when we think about accessible housing, I think there's similar crises there that we're just not, like we're just not, you know, we're not seeing, we're not looking at and we're not digging into to be able to shift, partially because when people are isolated like that, it's unseen, like it's hidden. People are just in their own homes. And like, how else are we going to know about that um, if, 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 you know, we're not working together as a community to create more visibility in some way? Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot to that. I think, you know, maybe I'll kind of just go through a few things that I, that I touched on just to remind myself too of what we've talked about. But one thing was about inaccessible housing and how it's tied to like mobility and isolation and like wheelchairs and accessing things like that in the health system. There's the limits to accessibility where it doesn't actually seem to exist as true accessibility. We have things that are partially, but there seems to be this thing where it's a roof over your head is enough. You don't need a bathroom, especially bathrooms especially get forgotten um, but and that's that's the extent landlords and uh, people who manage places developers including government they have a lot of power in this area and they're often the people who are making decisions about accessibility and about the daily live reality for people with disabilities without following through on things and without having enforcement to ensure that those places and people are living up to what we need. Um, there's about affordability and accessibility and that this is as much a safety issue as it is about inclusion and communities. So yeah, like what is needed? I mean, we need things to change in all those areas. We need to look at accessibility differently as something that's about human dignity and connection between people like just somebody being able to get out on a cement block outside their home is not enough. We need things to connect. We need, <laughs> people need to be able to get out of their home to other people and, you know, to, to go into other people's homes as well. We need that connection. Um, and we need to look at how our systems and policies are either only partially addressing things or have those giant gaps that, you know, that, that I've brought up in, in those other areas that aren't about accessibility standards, but there are other systems that are impacting the ways in which we can access and experience these things. So yeah, um, when you think about accessible housing, what do you think of? And I'll open it up now and Kate, if you wanted to take it from there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andrew. Like you touched on a lot of really important issues there. Um, are you able to stop sharing your screen just so I know oh, so yeah. that? Yes. Like Thank that. you. Yeah, I think that the exhaustion felt by individuals uh, who are, you know, forced to play advocate for themselves all the time is, is definitely um, something we need to uh, continuously like uh, consider um, and safety, of course, is such a huge topic of concern that that it, people don't realize the connection. Um, and it's just that general awareness piece, of course, for, for individuals too, that you touched on with all of your stories. Um, so now, yeah, we do have 10 minutes where I, I hope I can invite questions from uh, our attendees. And, and maybe just to uh, keep this 
kind of organized and easily facilitated. If, if you could put in the chat like a cue, if you have a question and then I can call on people because I don't see a little hand raise option. So if you have a question, maybe just indicate in the chat and, and then I'll invite you to ask Andrew. Oh, Elise Johnson, you have a question. Hi, so. yeah, I have actually a ton to say and a ton to ask, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I did notice that in the housing programs, um, there was something for landlords to help retrofit or rehabilitate. I forget the name of it exactly. Um, basically, in my role now, I'm in the region of Queens. I'm an accessibility coordinator. I'm really trying to spread the word of all the different types of grants to all the different types of homeowners. So I was wondering, um, either you, Andrew, or if anybody else has had success in that area. And then just one more thing, and then I'll go mute again. Um, as I was looking for training programs for builders and contractors and developers, I found there were some, you know, certification for aging in place in the States and even BC has some <laughs> through, it was actually like the mortgage and housing corporation that I saw some things about um, accessible housing by design and certification and, uh, in the end, I think I got something from the Housing and Builders Association saying that they were developing some training for builders and that you would, you know, I guess you, Andrew, in the Standards Committee, can we start asking for this certification, like that it's a requirement to have that kind of training? So that was my two part, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so like around the, the granting programs for landlords, that mm -hmm. part of it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my, my experience around those types of things is that um, it's, mm, there's a lot of the types of requirements that I've seen that, that landlords have not, are not choosing to go forward with them because it'll mean that they can only then rent to you know, certain people and it's not a money-making thing anymore. Like I haven't so far, or anyone that I know, been able to convince a landlord to invest in something like that, um, unless it's something where you have a, you know, a personal relationship with somebody who is a landlord and is like wanting to specifically do that with you. Um, even for, you know, my, in for my my mom's home, um, some of the some of the programs that are out there, because I'm not her direct dependent, she couldn't access those either. And that yeah. seems to be a common problem for people accessing programs is that they want to make places accessible, but because there's not that direct connection, they they don't meet that criteria for getting it. Um, yeah, so those are those are a couple of things that I've experienced with them. I'd love to see more landlords that are taking on these programs, but there seems to be something about the criteria that is not enough. They're, like they're not, you know, they don't see the benefit to them as much to it. Um, that it's not moving forward. So I just don't see enough of it, like, yeah, actually actually happening in that sense. I just wonder how it, what kinds of things, you know, if landlords were asked, like, what, what could we do differently that would make this more appealing to you or things like that? Um, I wonder, what was the, the second part of your question? about um, trying to require certification of right. training like aging in place or visitable homes. I see you're trying to get in there, visitable, uh, adaptable for sure. I see in the code now. Yeah, yeah. And that's definitely a conversation that is happening around you know, the types of things that would be useful to, to, to have as you know, education or tools to try and shift that. So yeah, it's, yeah, definitely. Um, the programs in BC, I've learned a little bit about what's some of some of the ones there, and I, I like. There's one in particular that seems to have a lot of success around like safer homes and working with um, developers on that on, from that angle. Um, yeah, so like there's I would we don't have as much around here. You're right, like we haven't actually gotten to that stage of having those programs out, um, but we are doing some some learning as far as I know, and I'm. I'm looking forward to that, the next step of the process when some of that, I think, will become a bit more clear of what's going to happen. But if you have, you know, suggestions or ideas, like, you know, please bring them forward and 
we'll, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots that if you don't have the right connection, you're not going to know about it. So any ideas and suggestions are always welcome. I see that there are a few more questions. Um, Andrew, can I just ask you if, uh, if anyone has questions later as well, are we able to connect them to you directly through email? Yep, okay. definitely. That'd be great. Okay, but we'll try to get through these. Um, Colleen, I see you're next in the chat with a question. Oh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, this is fabulous. Um, Andrew, I hit. I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about values and attitudes uh, towards disability. That's underlying all of the standards and policies that we have is just not being valued. I'm with the Anna Kanish Affordable Housing Society. We have 14 units, affordable units. Four of them are barrier free, two one bedrooms and two two bedrooms. And we're about to build another 12 units and four of those, a third of them will be barrier free. Um, one of the issues around the policies when we are trying to look for funding from Nova Scotia Housing, they will give us $50,000 per unit, whether that's a one bedroom standard or a three bedroom barrier free, the same amount of money. So there is no incentive and it's very difficult for affordable housing to do that, but we are committed to that. My question is about ideas. Where can we get ideas to plan for the barrier free? As you've pointed out, <clears throat> there's so many different um, things that are barriers. How can we build, uh, where can we get the information to build with the future in mind of people coming into our barrier free units that might need a, a, a railing up or a, a track up on the ceiling? you know, that being proactive, but um, is there some place where we can go one-stop shopping to get information to help us build the best we can? Mm -hmm. Very yeah, bad. Um, it's a good question. It would be great if there was a one-stop shop for everything. Um, so far in my experience, like there are a few things that are, you know, good options to look at, like you know, there's the Rick Hansen accessibility um, area. They do provide uh, some some good starting blocks for things and how to do things. It can be really overwhelming because they have a lot of things to consider. Um, there's, you know, looking at the CSA standards around accessibility, which is more like very clear cut, like here's the measurement for this thing and this for this thing um, and different regulations like that. But honestly, you know, the thing is more so that I would, I would, I think of is, you know, are there people, individuals and groups that would be more of a resource? Like, you know, I, I do have a friend who does this kind of work um, uh, independently. She has her own small business um, to, to work with individuals who want to have accessibility in some kind of development. And okay. she'll do that work alongside people throughout a process. And I know that there's a few other places that do that because I find that, you know, a resource is good or, you know, a place to start looking for information is really good like that. But being able to ask the questions and continue to ask the questions yeah. is just so much more, you know. Um, so, yeah, like there's I can I, I don't offhand know the details for those things, but that's something that we can I think we can. Oh, is there someone who can toss things into the chat if if people have some of those resources or even names um, for suggestions, because yeah, just asking people that you know in, in your own communities too is always good. Because um, bringing in mm -hmm. people from BC is helpful, uh, but it's not necessarily gonna meet the needs in, in our communities um, or work for our environment even. So having people who are more local are always, always great. I was hoping for something in Nova Scotia, but that's yeah. very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah, and like, if, if you are interested in the person that I am thinking of, we can definitely connect later too yes. if you want. I'll do that. I appreciate that. Definitely. Yeah, totally. So I see that it's 1.30. So if anyone uh, needs to go right away, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, don't forget that there is another one of these presentations next Wednesday as well. So please keep looking at peachresearch.ca slash lecture series for, for updates on that. Um, for Andrew, if you're okay to take a question, maybe over time, 
uh, and we can we can just run a little few minutes over. Yeah. Okay. Um, Christine, if, if you're able to stick around and ask your question now, um, then you're welcome to. I or is it Kristen? Sorry. It's Christine, and thank you so much, Andrew. Um, uh, a lot of the people before me kind of asked the question, but I think it's just more of a thought is that um, it's, it's the advocate. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for sort of um, how we um, as a system, I'm in the healthcare system, can help advocate. Um, so form collaborative alliances um, and more flipping it on its head to sort of look more at um, holding the municipalities and the province accountable to their policies. Like often the policy might be there in place, but uh, where's the, you know, holding the builders and that kind of, you know, accountable for that, the developers, you know, it's more kind of looking to um, allied advocacy, looking at um, not so that it isn't just the individual that has to fight. And if you have any suggestions for that, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Like about how to how to go go about doing that. Mm -hmm. those, yeah. Those kind of organizing and advocacy. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's there's so much that can be done in that area. Mm -hmm. Like when. When I think about that kind of thing, I think back, I, I used to work for Hartwood Center for Community Youth Development mm -hmm. and just approaching everything from an engagement perspective of, you know, things that will, like if you're trying to connect with people around these issues, like what's gonna, what's gonna bring people or what's gonna, what's gonna engage people. And like, mm -hmm. you know, for myself, it, it's, it's, you know, I, think about why I got involved in the different committees or groups that I'm engaged in. And it's like the people who will come and meet me where I'm at and who really put um, like prioritize the voices of people with disabilities, like that's being the thing that this is about, you know, making sure that it's, this is like, I know that people will disagree on these types of things sometimes, but this is a human rights thing and approaching it from that lens. Um, and then also, you know, like it, it, that advocacy, like if you're asking for more details about how to do that, it's thinking about ways to make sure that accessibility is integrated into everything that's about the advocacy. Like that would be one of the main things that I would think about is, you know, if I'm trying to do this work, like making sure that my, my the way that I'm communicating with people and the emails and asking about what people's needs are, um, because everyone's going to have different needs, and like always starting from that that point of that your needs are important, they're a priority, and we're not just going to ask them and then skip over them. That if someone's accessibility needs, that's the priority of a group that's about accessible housing mm -hmm. and accessibility. Like when people see that that's what you're about, they'll come. Like that's mm -hmm. the thing is that you know there's there's times of of people out there, I think, who care about these issues. Um, and it's, you know, if, if you create spaces that are inviting enough for people and then and let people know that that's your approach and that's where you're coming from, if it seems like those are the groups that people tend to gravitate toward. Um, does that answer any of it? Or is it there something does. particular that you were looking for? That I no, that's, that's fabulous. And uh, thank you so much again. Cool, yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you everyone for your questions. Um, Milena, I see your microphone is on. Does that mean you would like to comment or question something? Oh, you can hear me there? Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. But I, I, I thought I, I was trying to figure figure out how to work out how to work out um my chat window here. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to say to the answer that everybody's uh had the questions for. I truly believe that every single city councillor to begin with and then you know moving in with the province is going to be more difficult but every city councillor needs to be uh, placed into a wheelchair and under blindfold and have their ears plugged and have mobility uh, um, walkers or anything for any person with any disability for an entire day with each disability to fully to fully understand 
what is actually needed and is what, what is actually uh, what should be in place. And then we can move forward a lot faster than I think that we are instead of having Andrew and, and any other individuals go through all the angsts that we do. Yeah, certainly the, you know, the tools to make uh, people like able-bodied people kind of uh, get an understanding, a little more understanding for, for what kind of experiences um, persons have in their daily lives. It would be helpful for that awareness piece for sure. And yeah, thank you, Milena. And uh, actually Milena will be speaking next week uh, as part of this series. So she has plenty more to say and we look forward to hearing from her as well. <laughs> um, is there, I don't, I think that concludes the questions from everyone today. So with that, uh, yeah, a little bit over time. Thanks for sticking around everybody. Um, Andrew, thanks so much. Uh, your, you know, your stories are very, very enlightening as I've seen people comment in the chat and very helpful for us um, as researchers and uh, to, to help us, you know, move forward with uh, awareness and uh, building more accessible places for sure. So thanks everybody. And please, you know, come to the next two. There's, like I said, next week, we're hearing from Milena about her experiences. And then a couple weeks after that on November 18th, we uh, hear from Anne Kamazi uh, from kind of a aging in place perspective and, uh, you know, seniors isolation um, and her experience as a senior with the accessibility needs as well. So thanks so much. And uh, please email peach uh, at dal.ca if you have any further comments or questions for Andrew or about the lecture series or any of our work at Peach Research Unit. Yeah, All right. feel free to reach out to me through that. Yeah, welcome, welcome the connections. Great. <laughs> All right, bye everybody. Thanks.